I absolutely agree. We, we should think about that. And actually, when we discussed about the guidelines for imaging, we discussed this topic also because um, when we uh, yeah, when we, when you all started to treat myeloma patients, sorry, the life expectancy was one, two, three years, and we didn't care too much about that. And the good thing is now we have to care about it because our patients live so long and hopefully longer, longer, longer. And um, we have to care about that. That's the reason why we use low dose CT. That's the reason why I say don't do it every year because it's just not not necessary anymore. That's the reason why I say we should use MRI more often. Um, the problem is, in my experience, uh, I'm not sure if it's a specialty of hematologists, but they sometimes need time to develop into this new area. And I, as I said, I still discuss with pay, uh, with colleagues. I just I came to Buffalo in uh, Roswell Park uh, four months ago, and the first like my first act was getting rid of skeletal survey, <laughs> because if you do that every year. Um, it's much higher radiation dose than if you do a CT and then only if it's necessary the next one, the same with PET CT and MRI doesn't even have radiation dose. On the other hand, uh, we have to be careful. The radiation dose is there, it's a topic, but on the other hand, um, it's just a statistical thing. It doesn't mean that you develop cancer from this radiation. It's just um, it's like you weighing your benefits and disadvantages is what I try to do in, in my talk. If you have um, this important information, and as the doctors in the ER said, we just need this information right now, we cannot care about later. But um, I think it's changing a bit and we are thinking more about the, the late effects of our treatments and also of our diagnostic. So I think it's important, and you should mention that to, to the colleagues, really ask, is it really necessary? Right. And if they can convince you that it's necessary, then it is. Right. But if they say, yeah, maybe we could do something else, then yeah, do it, yeah. right? So yeah. I think it's, it's yeah. a good point to mention. Yeah, yeah it's, I, I mean, you can <laughs> I mean, we have very limited experience yeah. with the GVAM migraine and myeloma. Yeah. Um, I think that the nice thing is that you can give it if you're in renal failure, for instance. You don't yes. have to worry about creatinine. You don't have to worry about area under the curve, concentration peak, you know, whether you have renal, you just give it, period. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that there's an advantage kind of in our alternating. You might, what you might avoid is that uh, you don't have the rebounds effect uh, to activate the osteoclast after stopping, you know, the exgiva. So it's an interesting approach, to be very honest, I haven't even thought about that. <laughs> yeah, it, I don't know what insurance will say, you know, because they have to cover both, but yeah. I'm not sure. Maybe we should do a clinical trial, you know, <laughs> alternating. <laughs> Oh, there's a uh, very good and very challenging question. Starting with the bone pain, you can have bone pain without bone destruction. Uh, in my experience, um, I know that from, from acute leukemia patients where the bone marrow is even much more proliferating, like the cells divide very, very, very fast. And we had patients who had really bad bone pain without any change of the mineralized bone, but just of the pressure. I mean, if you have a bone marrow uh, biopsy, you can feel it, you can, you can like anest do anesthesia outside, but not in the bone marrow. So at, as far as, as soon as you get into the bone marrow, there are also nerve endings. So just the tumor pressure can cause bone pain. One possible answer, as I mentioned with the x-ray, I I'm, don't want to backstab my colleagues, but uh, I do it a little bit. I think you might overlook stuff. Yeah, it's depending on where you look. For the long bones, the skeletal, the conventional x-ray is the same when we compare that. It's the same because you don't have too much so-called trabecular bone, which is like a sponge uh, that you have in the pelvis and in the spine. There you really should do a CT, it's my recommendation. And I will argue with colleagues if they don't agree, um, because the data just shows that and our experience as well. And so it, it might be the sensitivity issue that they just don't see it because it's the wrong technique or the, the less sensitive technique. Uh, or it might be that there is nothing but the bone is still um, impaired by something else or by the pressure of the, of the tumor mass. That's for the first question. Of course, an experienced radiologist has more experience. Uh, so 
yes, and depends um, that, I mean, also in a small private practice, a doctor can be very good, and in a large center, the doctor can be very bad, being in a large center, so, I mean, no doctor is very bad, of course, sorry. No, um, yeah, of course, it depends on experience as well, and I forgot the third question. Oh, just the different uh, between the yeah, different Yeah, same. I mean, one can be very experienced, another maybe less. And since myeloma is not that common, um, it might be difficult. On the other hand, really, if you have the right technique, <laughs> then it's rather easy to see. I mean, in a CT, to not see an osteolysis is not so easy. And I'm a hematologist, and even I see those. I mean, I do it for... 15 years now, but still, even I see the osteolytic lesion. So I think in MRI it's a little bit more difficult because you can also have other reasons and for the PET the same, but those doctors are very trained for this and the PET CT is usually not in a, like, in a very small practice. They are more experienced with that. May I uh, take, we have a comment from the peanut gallery. <laughs> Let's start the debate. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say is that um, in defense of our radiology colleagues, that um, being a myeloma doctor, I was very often surprised um, how, how, that you make a diagnosis of multiple myeloma via an x-ray, and you have to agree. So a patient has just pain or has a, uh, by, by chance, an x-ray, and the result comes back, lytic lesions most compatible with multiple myeloma. So I found, to be very honest, uh, I'm always very surprised and positively surprised, you know, that there's such a typical feature of multiple myeloma in an x-ray that the radiologist can make a diagnosis based on an x-ray. And, and this is, I found, very kind of, you know, um, uh, convincing, you know, that usually the doctors are very good. I think the problem arises, you know, when you compare, is it 10 small lesions versus 12 small lesions? You know, who is counting the small lesions? And I think what will really help here is that we have computer analysis to see and measure, you know, is there kind of, you know, a larger, bigger lesion. Um, I don't think that doctors really overlook lytic lesions. I think uh, sometimes they use different techniques and then you have maybe a different and Jens, help me, you know, if you have a different, I would say, kind of, you know, technique to do a skeletal survey, you might overlook, kind of, you know, or not see one or the other loosened zeolytic lesions because on the, kind of, you know, strengths of the, I would say, kind of, you know, radiation you are using. Um, but I guess, in general, the picture what you see in x-rays is so typical for multiple myeloma that you can just make a diagnosis based on the, on the, on the picture. So I'll start with the, with the CAR-T questions. Um, it, is, it is still not completely clear why some patients respond and why some patients don't, because even the initial response does not occur in 100% of the patients. And why do some patients recur, whereas some patients are two, three, four, five years out of therapy with no evidence of disease? Uh, there is a lot of research going into that. We know about a couple of factors that are very important. One of them is the, the ability of the cells to expand in the patient. And that's more of an observation than a mechanism, but in those patients where we don't see an expansion in the first couple of weeks, not likely to respond. It means that the T cells are either weak to, to begin with or have not encountered the right antigen uh, well enough or that some, something in the environment did not support their growth. So that's a clear predictor of, um, of response, and, and that also is a clear predictor for some of the side effects. So those patients who do develop bad cytokine release syndrome, it's also related to the amount of disease they've had, the <coughs> level of expansion of the cells in their body, and the ultimate response to the cells. Why do some patients lose their response at some point? Uh, there have been several mechanisms described. But it's important to note that they're not the same for all diseases, and they're not the same for all the targets. So it, uh, we don't know that we could take our knowledge from one disease and one target to a different one. In the case of CD19 cars in lymphoma or ALL, it has already been demonstrated that when patients recur, about half of them just lose the expression of that CD19 on the surface of their cancer cells. 
So what that means is that probably even initially they had a small clone, a few cells that did not express just by chance. CD19, the T cells got rid of everything else and those few cells were resistant and started growing back. But that's not the only resistance mechanism. There could be other reasons why these T cells fail ultimately. Um, one of the reassuring things is that it does not seem to involve what we call sanctuary sites. Sometimes in certain blood malignancies, uh, cancer cells can hide in the brain or in other areas where chemotherapy tends not to penetrate and other agents don't go in so well. The CAR T cells go in there very well because they're part of our own immune system. You need your immune system in the brain. So there's clear documentation that CAR T cells go into the brain and can work there as well. Um, and in fact, patients, kids with leukemia who had brain involvement at the time of their treatment have completely resolved that and it never came back. So, uh, but there's, it's a great question and there's still a lot of, a lot of research that needs to be done um, on that. Um, and your mortality. mortality, yeah. Great question, I actually didn't say that and I, and I should have. Um, so far, in all of the trials, the mortality has been between one and three percent. Mostly because of either extremely severe cytokine release syndrome that did not respond to any therapy, or uh, rare neurological side effects that led to such amount of damage acutely that um, unfortunately mm -hmm. led to death. But it's the range that, in my opinion, is probably at the same range or even lower than an autologous transplant. And as you've seen, the age ranges where this was used, up to age 76 in the lymphoma studies, up to age 73 in the myeloma studies, I think that also provides some degree of um, reassurance on how safe this approach might end up being in the future. The second question. Yeah, to the, the bone, uh, the osteonecrosis. I mean, uh, osteo means bone, so radiation, expo uh, the radiation-based uh, techniques are the best. And actually, um, dentists already use a very good technique where they have this um, X-ray beam moving around the body or around the, the uh, mandibular. And there you can see it very well. So a, a conventional, I mean, contradicting everything I said all my talk long, um, is really, for this, it's really the best. You can see how the bone is impaired, and that's actually the best technique. Or it's very well available because every dentist usually nowadays has it, and it's, it's very good for that. Yeah. I'm not that used to the US system yet. <laughs> Germany get it gets reimbursed um, but we have I mean I have a lot of patients who just said I don't want to take it anymore either in revision or not and sometimes have good experience in some patients I in my mind not to them but I in my mind I call them Lena little my dependent patients I mean as soon as the disease comes back I think there's another like another milestone where you can argue again to to, that the treatment is needed. It just um, published from, from the German group, it just published a paper where, or, um, at the last hematologist's meeting, at the ASH meeting, we showed that um, we compared uh, treatment until complete remission versus treatment for two years, which is both not common because nowadays we treat until progression, as, as you mentioned, and we found that actually the longer treatment is better. But um, Still, it's we have. I think it depends very much on the patient, and I don't know your dad, but um, I think it also depends. It can be good. I mean, he might have a lot of years without any treatment at all. We still don't know which patient really need the lenalidomide to stay in remission. What what we know is the statistics that more lenalidomide seems to be better. But if for the individual patient this is true, we don't know. So we, we don't have factors that tell us you need more or you need less uh, treatment. So I, I don't know if you have other comments on that. May I say that there, there, on the International Myeloma Foundation website, each week there's an update as to which foundations have funds to help patients with drug costs. And it's, it's updated weekly. It's a little green flag. So myeloma.org. Yeah, we, we have those cases, I have to say, rarely, that we cannot give the drug. 
you know, but it occurs, especially when you practice around Colombia, where you have, I would say, a patient population that is not that wealthy and has sometimes limited insurance. Um, Monique, our nurse, left, but she works also with certain pharmacies who are very innovative to, I don't know, sometimes they have a grant from somewhere and their Leukemia Lymphoma Society or their or Celgene or other, I would say, support groups that have some money left, so maybe try kind of, you know, to use those resources. Um, if, if you cannot get really support for Revlimid, then look for alternatives, but that happens. You know, we also have patients, we have to modify our treatment according to what insurance is paying or what the insurance is not paying, unfortunately. Yes, that is well known. That I mean, that the uh, the duration of the remission after transplant predicts the response. So therefore, a second transplant really does not make any sense if the remission is 12 months or less, uh, or less usually. Um, yeah, great, great question. So um, we talked about the one target that has been now been used by at least uh, three or four different academic centers slash manufacturers, which is uh, BCMA, and BCMA is also a target for other uh, pharmaceuticals such, such as antibody drug conjugates, so it's a fairly uh, well-established um, antigen expressed on the surface of myeloma cells. Um, other targets are being explored. One of them you mentioned CS1, CD38, CD138. Uh, there's another target called NYEZO1, which is not exactly a CAR, but it's a similar strategy that um, engineers T cells to recognize the, the myeloma cell. Um, and, you know, that's, that circles back to the question that was asked about what to do at the time of relapse or why do some patients don't respond. Without even understand, fully understanding the mechanisms or the why, it makes sense to potentially um, have two separate targets. So you could either sequence these CAR T cells in case one of them fails or even potentially engineer two different T cells and just mix them together, or even engineer one T cell to express two cars against two different antigens. All of those things are uh, definitely experimental right now and are in very early phase clinical trials without any mature results that we could really say that this is any better than standard BCMA and even the experience with BCMA that I've shown you is on 15 patients. So we need more and more data on all of these uh, strategies. But it, it makes sense as a strategy to overcome um, resistance to CAR T cells, absolutely. Yeah, so, um, well, I'm gonna circle back to another part of your question which was about using the CD19 CAR in myeloma, which is an experience that was done at, um, at Penn when I was still there in 11 patients. And uh, we were very encouraged because patient number one on that study had a stringent complete response that was sustained for more than a year or 18 months. Um, however, in subsequent patients, the responses were not as striking. The idea of using CD19 as a target in myeloma is that, there, is that the myeloma cells are a late mature phase of a normal B cell that expresses CD19. So even if the myeloma cells themselves don't express CD19, perhaps there's an early population, that we would call them the, stem, the myeloma stem cell population because all the myeloma grows from those cells. And if we get rid of those, that will get rid of the whole disease. So based on the pen experience that was kind of mixed, I am not sure if that strategy is still moving forward now that we have other targets, as you mentioned, multiple targets that are more better established on, uh, on myeloma. Uh, the, the armored cars um, is another technological advancement. People are trying to find other types of genetic engineering methods and ways to target also antigens that are not necessarily expressed on the outside of the cell, but sometimes on those that are in the inside of the cell. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps again, overcome some of the mechanisms that, um, that make myeloma cells um, resistant. And there are always, there are also additional genetic engineering techniques that try to put on and off switches 
inside these CAR T cells. So in case someone develops severe side effects, you could potentially turn them off. Or maybe you could give them to the patient and be able to turn them on at some point if you really need them to be active. So, so all of those are really another piece of science fiction movie to me. And um, we'll need to see over the next few years which of those really goes into more mature clinical trials and if there's any difference between them and the ones that are out there today. This is the last question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'd like to take things um, sort of back up to a global level. There are lots of cancers that, that there are cures for now. There, as we know, there's not a cure for multiple myeloma yet. What is different about multiple myeloma compared to other cancers that make it so difficult to cure? Since I don't know the answer, I'll pass it to <laughs> my colleague. <laughs> I think that's an, that's an excellent question. I think obviously um, uh, nobody knows the answer to that. Um, I think one of the reasons which you can um, you know, speculate obviously is that it's a combination of when you think about the answer is um, derived from the tumor cell itself. So it may cannot be inherently more resistant to whatever you throw at the uh, tumor cell. On the other hand, it may be a combination of the tumor cell and the microenvironment it creates. Because basically, the tumor cell itself would dictate the response, let's say, to direct chemotherapy drugs, but the microenvironment may be the one which influences the response to immunotherapies. And I think probably you need both responses to recure the disease. And I think the myeloma might be a particularly hostile environment for both the immune response, which we know that, for example, all the drugs, which are currently also creating such a buzz in terms of you know, activating the immune system, have so far not really been necessarily that successful in myeloma, you know, the so-called checkpoint inhibitors. So that, I think, probably the answer is based on inherent factors in the tumor cell and the environment. That would be my thoughts. I do have one thought. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I agree. We, we, we still considered myeloma, even with those phenomenal results that we're seeing with some of the newer therapies, still considered an incurable disease. But the truth is that when you think about those diseases that have become curable with time, it didn't just happen like that. And the best example, I think, is um, aggressive lymphoma that had originally in the 60s and 70s had all kinds of single agent chemotherapies until someone in the early 80s put all of them together and gave people a regimen that we now call RCHOP, which is five different agents together figuring out what are the right doses and what's the right combination and for how many cycles. And voila, 60, 70% of patients are cured from that disease. So um, I don't have the crystal ball, but now that we have all of these efficient treatments, perhaps it's really just in the right combination that we'll figure this out just a couple of decades later, that's all.